And good afternoon. Um, I haven't got a presentation, and that in this particular case is because I'm genuinely reacting to the presentations that I've heard. Um, so it's been a stimulating first half of the afternoon, and I'm very glad to have the opportunity to reflect a little bit on, on what we can use this work for in development of EU uh, policy. Intellectually, we can use it for a great deal. Um, Intellectually, both of these reports represent major steps forward in our understanding of what it is that we're doing. I'm not going to focus on this side, but I think it's important to note that before I move on to the more policy-orientated dimension. I think the market quantification, the sophistication of the decomposition analysis that Tyler presented, the comparison of countries, which is something we're groping towards, um, the work on that whole range of multiple benefits, and I was involved most closely in the macroeconomic work. I went to one of the seminars that was organized by IEA to prepare that, and I still remember and use many of the insights that came from that one seminar. So this uh, is a very impressive step forward in terms of our intellectual and methodological and empirical understanding of the sector that we work in. But I'd like to reflect more broadly on where this helps or doesn't help with the EU policy development process. And I'm talking about that policy development process as we experience it. I'm not making any claims for generality about EU policy processes or about energy efficiency policy processes in general. And I suppose the, the question uh, that we tend to ask is, given that this stuff all stacks up, given that you don't need anything like all of Nina's multiple benefits to tell a story in which this makes sense, given that you don't, you can be a climate denier and tell a story in which all of this makes perfect sense. You don't need climate change for this to make sense. Given all of that, why are policymakers not falling over themselves to rush forward with these uh, with policies to promote energy efficiency why is it that the latest echoes we're hearing from the discussions for the end of this week are not encouraging in terms of the focus on energy efficiency and sitting there listening i came up with five arguments that we have to deal with. The first one is, this stuff just doesn't make sense. The second one is, well, all right, it makes sense from a life cycle point of view, but it doesn't make sense for investments, and we lack money for investment. The third one, all right, it makes sense in theory, but we don't know how to make it happen in practice. The fourth one, well, it seems, I mean, what you say is eloquent, but there are only marginal actors only people wearing sandals actually seem to agree with you, so it can't really make sense. And the last one is, all right, I've heard everything you say, but I still don't actually believe it. And in a sense, in order to move this agenda forward, we sometimes have to deal across the whole range. I mean, I'm not talking specifically about the European Commission. I'm talking about the whole range of policy-making partners that we have and stakeholders that we have with variants of those five arguments, and I want to go through them a little bit and reflect on where this work relates to those arguments. The first one, um, this doesn't make sense. Now, you would think that, that, that we're beyond that, but it's interesting that our modelling assumes that the costs, first of all, that the right way to describe the non-financial barriers to energy efficiency is as a cost, is, is as a discount rate. Secondly, that that discount rate represents a real cost. So that if people will only clear out their lofts if it pays back for them in two or three years' time, and we develop a public policy that leads them to clear out their lofts, 
the cost of that public policy is represented by the, 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 the we're forcing them to do something which is so expensive to them that they'll only do it if it pays back in two or three years' time. That's what our modelling still does. So the this doesn't make sense at all hypothesis is actually built in right at the heart of our policy making, let alone any of the slightly more soft variants of why we shouldn't do it. And this links to both micro, that's a micro debate. So one of the debates is what makes sense in terms of energy efficiency measures in a micro economic world. This is the whole discount rate debate that you're all and we are sick to death of. But that's a critical area that we have to get to the bottom of if we're going to take this policy area forward. The second one is the macroeconomic benefits. And Nina, you said that all of the modeling that you'd seen gives a positive macroeconomic result. But our modeling, we have two scenarios, one of which gives a positive and one of which gives a negative effect on GDP. So we still, and the, the one that gives a negative effect on GDP, and we, what we say is, on the one hand, on the other. So we're still at a point in the, in the policy, in European policy making where the GDP effect is on the one hand on the other. And the modelling that says you don't have a positive effect on GDP is modelling which says all resources in society are fully used, which is a straightforward neoclassical assumption. And so we still need to address some fairly, in order to show that this thing makes sense at all, there are some fairly important intellectual discussions to be had. And there, I think your stuff doesn't much help on the microeconomic, but it's pretty helpful on the macroeconomic side, if only showing that it isn't on the one hand on the other, it's on the one hand and on the other 25 hands that we have um, modeling that is suggesting there is a positive <coughs> macroeconomic impact of this work. That's the first area. And the things about asset values and so on, which are not yet built into the macroeconomic modelling directly, but are relatively easily built in because they're still money things, are another step in that direction. The second argument that it makes life cycle sense, but it doesn't make investment sense, is the one that says, all right, we see that if you look from a 2030 perspective, you will have spent a lot of money, 12 trillion, but you'll, that was 20, 20, 2035, but you will have saved 18 trillion. The, the, this argument says, yes, but where are we going to find the 12 trillion? which is a not unreasonable question. So the second set of issues that we're involved in discussing is how to trigger those investments. They can never be public sector. The scale of investment that we're talking about is one where it can never be primarily a pub public sector discussion. It should not be a public sector discussion because the private benefits are enormous. But the debate is conducted. I was very interested in the data that Tyler gave that so showed that out of the 310 to 360 billion dollars a year in the market, all but 120 was self-financed. So we don't actually discuss this problem as if it is something where the, the basic finance for energy efficiency is coming from the people who benefit from it directly, and we need to understand that an awful lot better. In addition, you'll in addition, you'll be aware of the work that we're doing through the Energy Efficiency Financial Institutions Group, and Bettina is here somewhere, there she is, <laughs> Bettina Dorendorf, who looks after that group, to ask the financial institutions, what is it that is stopping you from investing more in these measures? What is it that you need in order to overcome that? Their answers are more micro than macro. This material would not help us convince them. What will help us convince them is standardised contract forms, standardised labels for products and buildings, data on the impact, verified data on the impact of individual investments. And their being convinced will in turn enable us to convince policymakers that, that, that the shift from spending $18 trillion on fuel to spending 12 trillion on investment is exactly what financial institutions do day and night and that this sector is as capable of doing that as any other sector. So I think you make a contribution there but the battle we have is more complex. Tyler's report though is thinking in a more general way that we need to get. We have in DG Energy we have the nice green sustainable director at sea with renewables and technology development and energy efficiency and then we have the hard-headed people of the world in Directorate B who do wholesale markets, retail markets 
And actually, that sort of structure disincentivizes us from realizing that our problem is actually a market functioning problem. You know, we're not any more, we are in the same battle as our colleagues who are trying to make electricity markets work and reduce um, oligopoly power in those markets. We're in the same discussion. This is not the Greens versus the hard headed, uh, business orientated people. So, taking those steps, I think your work very much helps us to, to take. The third argument we deal, deal with is, well, okay, we see it makes sense in theory, we see we can overcome the investment problem, but, it's a, but even if you are describing a better world, and we agree that it's a better world, it's worth getting to that world, we don't have any evidence that it's actually possible to get there, and therefore it has no more value than all the other utopias that have been derived from uh, emigrants to New Zealand and other parts of the world for many uh, centuries, I think you've had Aruhan. Um, the why is this? Why can we actually get there? And the arguments there. This is what Mr. Ertiger doesn't believe, but he he characterised that as a Sunday speech argument that everybody goes to church on Sunday and prays for energy efficiency, and then from Monday to Saturday they act as if it doesn't exist. And, um, <laughs> And that is a real problem. And there, um, it's important, I think the most important thing in our July communication was the evidence that actually it does, policy does seem to be working. Four years ago, our answer to the question is, are we on track for the 20% objective, was we're on track for 9%. And now, our answer is, we're on track for 18 to 19% in 2020. Why? The skeptics say, ah, it's all the economy. But using tools that have been developed by the IAA and colleagues to try and decompose that, we reckon the economy is contributing a third of the progress. The other two thirds is efficiency. And within the two thirds, a part is autonomous choices by European industry which is improving its energy intensity twice as fast as American industry, despite being more efficient to start off with, a part. The other part, amazingly, seems to be policy. So all the things that we've been doing, actually in terms of product requirements, in terms of building requirements, in terms of CHP, and all the things that member states have been doing, are actually beginning to deliver what looks like, what looked between 2005 and 2008 before the crisis, like a decoupling. And so the fact that we have evidence that policy is working, and that's very much reinforced by the analysis in the Energy Markets Report, and we need more and more sound analysis in that sense. The fact that policy is working is the next piece in the jigsaw that we need to fill in. And your work very much helps us do that. The fourth <coughs> argument we need to deal with is, ah, you silver-tugged sandal wearers, you. You know, you're able to spin a nice yarn. I'm glad to see there aren't many sandal wearers here. I mean, this was George Orwell's uh, reproach of the left in the UK that it was full of, uh, in the 30s, full of sandal-wearing vegetarians, and who could expect anybody to listen to them? And um, <laughs> I mean, I am a vegetarian, I apologize for that, but um, <laughs> it's uh, at a cycle. And, um, you know, we need, we, need, and we need to not be seen like that. This is, of course, this is a completely useless and pathetic and prejudiced argument, but all the same, if we are to win the debate, it needs to be seen that we're on the side of the big battalions. And IEA contributes, I'm sure you're aware of this, just by being a big battalion just by being a proper organization. Um, 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 a few years ago, when I was working on another policy area, um, I was actually called a liar in an internal meeting, quite bitterly, by a colleague, because we'd attributed a fact to the IEA, which was only attributable to an IEA working group report and not to the IEA itself. In other words, I was claiming the authority of the IEA for my assertion, and that was a claim 
to be challenged and not to be taken in vain. So the very fact that you've done this wonderful work from where you're coming from, which is basically an objective starting point, and a starting point which is not parti pris, is a real contribution to the discussion. It wouldn't be a contribution if the work itself wasn't so good, but I think it's an additional contribution because it is. Um, having said that, um, we don't only have the IEA. I mean, the 40 companies that came out in support of an ambitious energy efficiency target uh, in addressing heads of state and government earlier this week included some of the IEAs of the business world, um, Siemens, General Electric, and Philips, to mention a few. Um, so it's also clear that actually what we're doing is becoming mainstream in the understanding of, for the reasons that you've explained, I suppose, is becoming mainstream in the understanding of the, of the business sector. But still, it's not yet the case that the, um, it's not yet, I mean, it's not necessarily yet the case that the channels of influence that all policies need to have if they're to be successful are as carved out in this area as they are instinctively towards other areas. All change is difficult. CCS is another example of a policy which is difficult uh, area of change to get. This is not about you know, the specialness of, of environment and people are, are prejudiced against it, but all change is difficult, but we are beginning to carve out those channels, but the IEA contributes very significantly to that. The fifth argument is, <laughs> you know, all right, I've heard everything you say, yes, I'll say yes, just so that you go away, but then what I'm actually going to do is what I would have done anyway. I had a meeting we had with some colleagues with um, colleagues from the Ukraine the other day who were saying, we desperately want to, from an industrial sector, we desperately want to deliver on efficiency. What we need is for the EU to come and say to us some of the things that you need to do in order to avoid being trapped if there should be an interruption of your gas supplies include energy efficiency. That's the trigger we need. And somehow all of our analysis and all the work we've done to make energy efficiency central still hasn't got across in the perception of the message that we're giving when we talk to Ukraine, as an example. And yet, if there's potential in Sweden for energy efficiency, there is 10 times as much in Ukraine for efficiency at, at a hundredth the cost, probably, um, no, at a tenth the cost, we'll say. Um, so somehow we are not yet talking we're not even talking the talk. In some ways, it's weird. In some ways, you know the expression, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? And in some ways, the EU is walking the walk. We're out there banning vacuum cleaners. <laughs> but we're not talking the talk. And sometimes you have to talk the talk as well. And I think there, the whole multiple benefits analysis is a very helpful contribution to talk in the talk. But in the end, you just have to keep going round and round and round, and eventually this becomes what it deserves to be and what your work helps it to be, which is part of the mainstream. Thank you. Briefly, in case you want to zone out now and not listen to the rest of what I'm going to say. Yes, they are. They're extremely useful. Thank you. Um, they are already helping policymakers in some areas. Um, but I think we need to make better use of them, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Um, and also, Nina, you said earlier, you said that um, your executive director said, we need to start putting a face on energy efficiency. And I think we need to go even further. The multiple benefits report starts putting a face on energy efficiency. I think we need to get it down to an even lower level. Um, I represent major companies, and yet I am still viewed by policymakers as a sandal wearer. It, it, um, you know, I represent businesses, but I'm still the sandal. I don't mind being a sandal wearer. I probably am. I probably qualify personally. But um, one of my members, who is a very large global insulation manufacturer, said, why do you keep talking to the policymakers and the politicians? Why are you not talking to the public? Because if they say they want it, then all this, yes, we've heard all your arguments, but I don't care, we're going to carry on doing what we've always done, 
might stop happening. Um, so I think we need to tell some stories, some really specific local stories about some of these multiple benefits, uh, as well as having the macro level things. Um, so where do I think we're at at the moment? Thinking, um, well, sorry, before, before I go into that, uh, I do want to stress, though, how useful I think these reports, as they currently stand, are. Um, energy efficiency, and Paul, you, you alluded to this. It's always been seen as something separate. The energy system stops at the meter, and then there's some stuff that goes on at the other side, which is not part of the system. It's an add-on, and if we've got enough money, well, wouldn't it be lovely to do some of it? tends to be a slight mindset around energy efficiency. And I think what both of these reports can help us to do is move the conversation towards a recognition that this thing called energy efficiency is a fundamental element of our energy infrastructure. That's what it is, and that's what it should be seen as. Um, we've got lots of lovely policy statements that say energy efficiency is central to our energy policy aims but we don't yet have enough action that matches those policy statements. And I think these can really help with that. Okay, so in terms of where we are at the moment, looking first at multiple benefits. Um, and again, Paul, this is gonna echo what you said. It's the great thing about going last, actually, mm -hmm. everybody said it already, but you know, I'll reinforce it. It does give us a lot more information that strengthens the argument that energy efficiency makes economic sense. Fundamentally, it does that. The more that we can monetize different benefits, the stronger our argument. And you do see in some policy and program appraisal methods, these multiple benefits starting to be included. Although, as we've already heard, and I think we all know the data can be quite tricky uh, on those things. But, as Paul said, even when the cost effectiveness is acknowledged, and it's cost effective without any of the other multiple benefits, uh, action is still limited, so we've got a problem. We don't yet have a strong coalition fighting energy efficiency's corner. It's still just us sandal wearers in the corner. Um, okay, what about the energy efficiency markets piece and the current state of play? I am really pleased to see that the first fuel argument is starting to be used. I think it's a great phrase, it's a great way of framing it. Uh, when my association was formed 33 years ago, pre my time, I hasten to add, um, we defined energy efficiency as the fifth fuel, which we thought was very clever at the time, and it, it was quite good. It was the best there'd been at the time, but first fuel was a heck of a lot better than fifth, so well done on that one. We like that a lot. Um, the one area where I think, and it has been it was highlighted in the report, the one area where I think there really is some movement is on the finance side of things. I think there are a lot of programs in a lot of different countries where you can see that government recognizes that the appetite for financing energy efficiency is increasing but that there are market failures that there are barriers and they're starting to try and address those there's still work to be done but there are lots of examples of whether it's a green investment bank that sometimes invests in energy efficiency uh, guarantees on loans um, some great ESCO activity, you start to see that moving in the right direction. But I think the things that are missing is this real recognition of how important this sector is. And to me, the most obvious way that is demonstrated is in the lack of, um, the lack of sort of focus, the lack of recognition that we need policy certainty. If this is an important market that we want to develop, we can't keep chopping and changing on our policy incentives. I don't know if this is particularly a British problem, but it certainly is an extreme British problem. I'm sure it's not only us. Um, policies stop and start, they change every few years, nobody really knows what's going on. If this is an important market, which it is, we want people to invest in it, and if we want investors to have confidence, we need investment grade policy. And policy that changes by the month is not that. Okay. Um, what else could we do with multiple benefits that we're not already doing? How else can we use this work? Um, 
I think we need to use it to define energy efficiency as part of infrastructure. Um, the reason I say that is because if you start talking about something as part of national infrastructure, you unlock investment and you make people realise that it's the sort of priority that has to have consistent support. If you look at other policy areas where you get routine discussion and use of multiple benefits, and the two that immediately sprung to my mind were spatial planning, land use planning, and also things like major transport network development projects, that's infrastructure. Mm. And it's multiple benefits and infrastructure tend to go hand in hand. So energy efficiency has got similar characteristics in this sense. So we could start to use these multiple benefits arguments to say, look, this is a kind of infrastructure. It does support our economies. It does support well-being. Let's treat it like infrastructure. Ooh, wrong button. Um, I've put here another new use, but maybe it's a better use. Um, Nina, you, you, you talked about engaging new groups and building a coalition of support for, for energy efficiency. Um, and I think we can get better at doing that. Uh, it's kind of obvious to say that if you talk about the macroeconomic benefits of energy efficiency, you can get the climate sceptics on board. Um, if you talk in terms of the impact on public budgets, you can have that conversation with finance ministries, and maybe that's where you start to get them to see it as infrastructure investment. We've got a fair track record in the UK of using the health and well-being benefits argument to engage the health sector. But I think we need to be careful. As a fully paid up member of the sandal wearing fraternity, I'm tempted, I have to admit, to say, look at it, look at all these benefits, how fantastic is energy efficiency. It does this, it does that, it does that, it does that. Most people that you talk to will be completely turned off by the amount of information that comes at them if you talk about multiple benefits like that. Bringing them all into play when defining a policy appraisal process is right. When you're trying to engage somebody as a supporter of what you're trying to do, you need to focus on the one thing that matters to them. And I think we have a slight tendency not to do that because we get a bit over-enthusiastic about it. But I think it's also worth pointing out that you need the right messenger to put across that message. Um, in the UK, our infrastructure minister thinks, does think, does agree that energy efficiency is an element of infrastructure. So that tick, that person's convinced. But the finance ministry wants the Department of Energy and Climate Change to make the case for energy efficiency to be infrastructure. The fact that the infrastructure minister thinks it is, is, is irrelevant to them. They want the message to come from the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Um, so... You need to get, choose the message and choose the messenger to build that coalition. And I think if we get it right, if we use this information in the right way, it could be very, very powerful. In terms of the market frame and new uses of that, Philippe, you talked about changing the conversation, changing the dialogue. I think you're absolutely right. That's what struck me about it. Um, making it about investment, about jobs, about economic recovery. Uh, there's a lot of really useful information in that report that can help us do that. Um, and in the current economic state that we're in, that's really quite a good message. Um, I think we can also make, make some quite good use of the decomposition analysis. I think that's really helpful. Um, Again, maybe I'm being a little UK-centric, but the conversation about energy in the UK is about energy prices. The media in the UK are obsessed with energy prices, and we need to move the conversation away from that, because it's not about the price, it's about the cost, and it's about the benefits. And the decomposition analysis shows us just how much more we're getting for our money. And I think that's quite a nice, nice argument to make. That's what energy efficiency can do for you. It gives you more for your money. So move the conversation away from energy price. I'd also like to see us move the conversation away from the need for short-term financial incentives. 
oh no, everything's a bit wobbly in the market, quick, somebody shove some kind of little financial incentive in there that will get people to sit up and take notice and do something, which is what tends to happen in the UK. What I want to see happening is much more strategic development of policy, a policy framework that develops the energy efficiency market. And I love, in particular, the one thing that stood out for me was the Japanese LED lighting case. Really nice case there around, we got the policy framework right, and look, we've got an industry. And I, I liked, I'd like us to see us using that more in conversations with policymakers. Um, one challenge that I have for you at the IEA is to bring the two elements together. You know, it's hard enough doing the market report and the multiple benefits report, but how about a combined one? Okay. Just to keep you busy for the next decade or so. Uh, and the reason I say this is that I have a question for you. Um, in the markets report, there's, there's reference to the Italian tax deduction for residential energy efficiency measures. And the report says that um, it stimulated 23 billion euros of household energy efficiency investment at a cost of 13 billion euros in foregone tax revenue. Um, what were the benefits to the public finances of that household investment and where they included in that 13 billion? I don't suppose, knowing where the information came from, I don't suppose it was a net cost. Wouldn't it be nice if the markets report could say at a net benefit to uh, the public finances? Um, so it would be great. I know it's a tall order but I'd just like to challenge you. Let's bring those frames together because they'll be better than the sum of their two parts. Okay. I said at the beginning that I think we need to tell stories. So what I'd like to finish with is just telling you a couple of stories to illustrate what I mean. Um, and I'll apologise in advance because I am not the best storyteller in the world. So, you know, this is just a hint of what, how it might go. Um, okay. Uh, multiple benefits. Let me tell you a story about one, multiple, one of the multiple benefits, uh, which is around health and well-being. Um, there's a local area in the east of England where we've got quite high levels of deprivation, a lot of low-income households, and pretty poor quality housing. So we've got an issue. Um, we've also, in the UK, got a relatively new policy where, at the local level, responsibility for health and responsibility for social care have been brought together in what's called a health and well-being board. And everybody's got very excited about this as an opportunity for things to really come together and work very well. Um, I was talking to a housing manager in the local authority in this area. And this housing manager is passionate about energy efficiency and about what it can do to improve people's well-being, particularly those living in poor quality housing and who have low incomes. And when I first spoke to him, he was pretty down. He said, we've got this health and well-being board. What an opportunity. But the health professionals really don't see that I, as a housing manager, can do anything for them. They don't want to waste time talking to me. I can't open the door to have the conversation with them. Then along came a UK government funding programme that ran some pilot schemes on a range of energy efficiency actions in the local area. One of the pilots was in this area, and it was a scheme that explained the health benefits of energy efficiency to the local health sector and got GPs and health visitors, local nurses, involved in referring their patients for energy efficiency help, energy efficiency as medicine. Um, I spoke to the uh, housing manager after the end of the scheme, and boy, was he a happy man. He came out at the end of it, and he said, the door's open. They're talking to me. We're going to work together and that we're going to solve the problem because they have seen the difference this has made to their patients. So what we have here is a story that we can use. We can give it to other housing managers. We can give it to other health professionals and say, look, these guys who are like you, they're not like me. They're health professionals like you. They're convinced. So there's one story. That's the use of the health benefits. What about the market story? Um, 300 billion US dollars is, is, is an impressive number. Um, and I think most finance ministries will probably pay attention to that number. Um, 
But if we're going to your practicality problem, Paul, we need to engage the whole of the energy efficiency supply chain in making this happen. And a local installer, a, a local builder, a local housing contractor is not going to be enormously impressed by $300 million, other than thinking, that's big. It's not going to resonate with him. So here's another story. Um, there's an island community in the southeast of England, the Isle of Wight, for those of you who know the area. Um, it's got a small number of micro-businesses that are competent in installing energy efficiency measures. Until very recently, none of them could play any part in the delivery of energy supplier schemes. They didn't feel they could, they felt there was a barrier. Because the way that the energy suppliers set up framework contracts meant that they had to be willing to travel across a wide geographical area of the UK and install things anywhere. And they didn't feel that made economic sense to them. It wasn't how they wanted to operate their businesses. So they didn't reckon much to UK government energy efficiency policy because that's how they saw it. it as nothing to do with them. Um, now, these, these local installers were well respected in the local community. Householders in the local community believed them when they said something was a good idea. So if they badmouthed something and said this is a bit of rubbish, householders also believed them. Again, government funding for a pilot scheme to look at developing a local market for energy efficiency measures. Um, the local installers were specifically asked to deliver the messages the scheme wanted locals to do it, and they did it. They were initially sceptical. They said, oh, come on, we've had government funding before. We've had government schemes. It's never any good for us. Why should I bother? But they were convinced by the local council that they should take part. Um, they went out there to install the measures under the scheme. The community reacted well, because these were guys like them. They were members of the community. They were trusted. And then what actually happened was they got very enthusiastic and they started selling more energy efficiency measures. Not just the things they'd been asked to install in people's houses, but why don't you have one of these as well? Or even going to a house that wasn't being treated under the skin to do some work and saying, by the way, you know, I've been installing this stuff for Mrs. Watsit down the road. I think it'd be really good for you. So there is now the potential for the local market to grow properly, sustainably, in a way that we want to see it grow. And also, and coming back uh, to my point about um, trying to stop people doing, Paul, what you said, which is, yes, I believe you, but I'm going to ignore you, um, it's a heck of a good story for the local MP. Mm. Local business growth, local community members really happy. Uh, that's only one member of parliament on board, but if we can get a few more of them, then the civil servants and the cabinet need to start doing what we're asking for, rather than saying lovely and going away and ignoring us. So those are my stories. I need to think we need to do more of it. I think we need to make as much use of these reports as we can, because they're very, very helpful. Um, and um, I think we've all got a role. To Thank you.